Okay, good. So um, I want to say welcome everyone to uh, yeah the first the first seminar uh, for the quantum information structure of space time virtual seminar series uh, of the year. Uh, today the seminar is going to be hosted by uh, Jonathan Oppenheim. Um, so as we were saying before, it's going to be a, uh, a talk, uh, hopefully around kind of 30 to 40 minutes. And then afterwards, there'll be plenty, plenty of time for discussion. Uh, if you would like a clarifying question at any point, feel free to unmute. Uh, but anything that's kind of a longer or deeper question, uh, that can be saved to the end. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think with that, I'll uh, leave the floor to uh, Jonathan. And uh, yeah, please go for Great. it whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks, Matt, and thanks um, to the organizer for inviting me. Um, so this is some uh, joint work which has been going on for the last little while with um, Isaac Layton, Carlos Bracchieri, um, Barbara Schoda, and um, Zach Weller-Davies. And mostly I'll be talking about this um, path integral approach, which is joint work with uh, Zach Weller-Davies. Um, can people hear me okay? Uh, yes, but I don't see you. I don't know if it's just me or everybody. Um, no, for some reason I haven't got my webcam to work, so um, I, I'll, I'll, yeah, I apologize for that. It's not working. Okay. Um, good. Okay, so um, yeah, in, do interrupt with questions. Um, so um, I guess the starting the starting point is just maybe a foundational question, which is that we have um, two frameworks. We have quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, and we can just it's a natural question to ask whether these two different frameworks can be combined and can they interact with with each other. Um, so that's the kind of um, starting point I'm interested in from a foundational perspective. Now we can always have a classical um, system which influences a quantum system. For example, if we have a potential um, and a quantum system moving in that potential, we can tune that potential and modify it by twisting some knobs. And so classical systems can act on quantum systems. Double slit experiment is an example of that, where the walls um, of the um, box, for example, and the double slits we treat classically. Um, but the question is, can we have a quantum system with which back reacts on a classical system? Um, and I'm particularly interested in this question in the context of gravity, um, uh, because I think, um, you know, you can make a case that gravity appears to be different to um, our other forces. And some might, some of you know, would even say that it's not a force in the usual sense. Um, it's geometry. And so um, I think it's reasonable to just ask the question, can, uh, should we be quantizing space time or is somehow space time, um, some a priori background that we require in order to do quantum mechanics and therefore we shouldn't be quantizing it. Um, so that's the perspective and there's been uh, the debate that's gone on um, for quite some time, I think really starting with Feynman in the 50s um, and it's been going on to this day. Um, um, and I guess two things I would say about that debate is one that people often associate it, um, a classical quantum dynamics with the semi-classical Einstein equation where we um, look at expectation values of the quantum system. And I will not be talking about such a semi-classical Einstein equation um, because we know that that is pathological. Um, instead, I'll be talking about the kind of theories which have actually been known since the early 90s um, uh, where you can consistently couple quantum systems and classical systems. Um, and there have even been a number of experimental proposals which aim to, um, say, test the, uh, the quantum nature of gravity. And so this is the kind of line of research um, which, I, which I consider myself a part of. Good, so the results I'll present are um, as follows. Um, so we can ask the question, can we have a, well, we know the answer, we can have consistent classical quantum dynamics, but what we've been able to derive is the most general form of this dynamics. We have found that there are two classes of such dynamics, one which is continuous and one which has jumps in phase space. Um, we find that we can um, you know, write down a, a, what looks like a sensible um, theory where uh, space, the space-time metric is treated classically, nonetheless the fields remain quantum fields. Um, and if we do such a theory, then we find that we don't need the Born rule, um, or 
think about measurements, we somehow get the measurement postulate for free. Um, and then there are these ex experimental proposals that we can, um, that we are proposing, sorry, <laughs> experiments that we are proposing, um, uh, which arise from very general considerations about how classical systems have to be combined with quantum systems. Good. Um, I'm happy to take even non-clarifying questions just because I think it's, um, you know, people have uh, burning questions that are not kind of clarifying. Feel free to, to do that as well. Um, good. So the, 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 what I'd like to talk about is as follows. I will briefly um, talk about semi-classical Einstein versus the master equation approach and why um, why the uh, why the semi-classical Einstein equation fails and why the master equation somehow works. Um, and I may I won't talk, I'll talk about the in some sense what how we derive the most general form of this dynamics, and then I will talk about these. Um, experiments and 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 how we can um, use them to test the quantum nature of gravity. And I'll do a lot of this through the path integral because I think that um, it provides a nice way of seeing um, how quantum dynamics and classical dynamics and classical quantum dynamics all kind of have a very similar structure uh, and one that I think is quite beautiful. Um, so as you know, the semi-classical Einstein equation, we have it here on the right. Um, I guess, can people see my cursor if I do this? Yeah, I can see a cursor. Okay. Oop. Um, okay, um, good. So um, the semi-classical Einstein equation, we take the expectation value of the stress energy tensor. And so now we have a number on the right-hand side is equal to a number on the left-hand side in Einstein's equation. Um, and you can, See why, one way of seeing why this fails is is actually that it fails even classically, um, and it fails because it fails to account for correlations um, between the matter field and the gravitational field. So, for example, if I have a planet which I put in a in a, in a mixture, a statistical mixture of being on the left or the right, um, then um, the gravitational field will be correlated uh, with whether the planet is on the left or the right, and so one expects to have a correlation between the matter field and the gravitational field. And if you have a correlation, then if you take expectation values um, of a, an equation of motion, you're gonna get kind of a nonsense result. Um, you can see that um, by just looking at two classical systems and what happens when you take an expectation value when you have probability, probability distributions. And you can see this for two quantum systems and what happens when you take the expectation value of your equation of motion, you somehow get a lot of nonsense. Um, so that's the reason that uh, the semi-classical Einstein's equation fails. Um, it has very little do, to do with quantum theory and everything just to do with um, classical dynamics and probability distributions. Carlo? I got uh, confused when you were talking about quantum probability distribution and when you're talking classical probability distribution in this, what you just said. Oh, so here I'm talking about, so here I'm just talking about purely classically, the semi-classical Einstein equations fail. If you put expectation values in the semi-classical Einstein equation, then if we have a probability distribution um, then um, of, of the matter fields and the gravitational fields, then even just classically, the semi-classical Einstein equations will fail. If I use the term quantum probability distributions, maybe I meant if you take a density matrix of, um, of two quantum systems, then you can see that taking the expectation value can run you into trouble, even quantumly. This so, go in brackets, you mean quantum or classical? Um, either way, both. So here, when people talk about the semi-classical Einstein equation, they treat the stress energy tensor, they're thinking about it for being a quantum system. But we can, you know, we can just take the classical limit of this theory where we have a probability distribution, um, say, over the matter fields. And so even purely classically, I would say the semi-classical Einstein equation fails as an equation. I, I don't understand. If you have two different probability one, one story, probability two, two stories, what could go wrong unless you mix that expectation value in two different senses? Well, it, I mean, if this, if I take the expectation value of the stress energy tensor over a statistical Quantum. mixture of the planet being on the left or the planet being on the right, then the stress energy tensor no, no, looks like no, two half planets. That's not a semi-classical equation. You're you're disputing 
you're saying that something is inconsistent, but not the one, the one in which this uh, this uh, Dirac bracket uh, indicates statistical uh, explanation value. But but that's not what is usually called the semi-classical Einstein theory. That's what what's usually called is, is semi-classical Einstein theory. It's a quantum explanation value. It's nothing to do with the statistical one. Well, I'm not sure that there's, there's any difference. If I take an expectation value, if I take the trace mm -hmm. of this thing with the density matrix, then if I have a statistical mixture, then this thing will give, um, you know, it'll look like, if I have, for example, statistical mixture of um, a planet being on the left plus a planet being on the right, then the stress energy tensor will be two half planets. Now that That's you can, I think what you mean, yeah. I, I think what you... Statistical mixture on the right, you would have a statistical mixture on the left. Well, so, then I can take this, then I can take the expectation. So I think what um, what people, I'm just saying, if I take this equation seriously and I take the expectation value, now you can do something different. You can say, if I have a statistical mixture, I'm not really going to take the expectation value. I'm going to imagine that I'm in one branch of this statistical mixture. And I'm going to imagine that, okay, when I'm on the left, I'm going to take the expectation value. And I'm going to do um, uh, a different thing when I'm on the right. Um, but that is putting in by hand um, some additional kind of procedure. If I, uh, what I'm talking about is just taking this equation as it is and taking the expectation sure. value. Yes, it is. It's a quantum expectation value. I'm not sure what you mean by quantum or classical. I, this is a quantum expectation value, but I can, can still, the state itself is a statistical mixture. So if I take this state, row and i and i take the expectation value which is That's you know taking the true for, for density matrix is written for a pure state so well, the, that's right so you're putting in something by hand and you're saying this applies to the pure state but not to the mixed state no, i'm not putting something by hand i i i, I don't understand uh, sorry, how sorry to cut or... you off carlo uh, maybe this is a conversation we can uh, go into uh, further at the end sure sure sure, sure. Yeah. Just, Let me just say that if I take this as an expectation value where I take the trace of the stress energy tensor with the density matrix, which is, I think, what we mean by the trace of the, of the what we mean by the expectation value, then if I have a statistical mixture, I will get something which looks a bit silly. Now, you can say that I only do it when I have pure states, but um, I guess one of the things I would say about any theory is it should be linear and I shouldn't really know, I, you know. I should be able to treat density matrices the same way I treat pure states. So it shouldn't know whether I'm living in, if I have a density matrix or a pure state. Uh, but we can discuss this in, in more detail in the discussion. Um, it's not really germane to what we're, I mean, it's, it's, it's slightly tangential in the sense that I'm just saying there are issues with the semi-classical Einstein equation. I think we would all agree with that and I'm not going to be using it, but I'm just pointing out that one of the reasons that it, fails has to do with the fact that it doesn't encode correlations. And so we will be encoding correlations by looking at path integrals or density matrices, master equations. Okay, so let's ask what's the most general form of dynamics which couple, which couple classical systems and quantum systems. Um, and um, let's first say, before we do that, well, let's say, what do we mean by a classical quantum system? So what we mean is that we have a quantum system, like a spin half particle. So here's the spin half particle, a two level system. And it, there is also a classical degree of freedom, like a point in phase space. So um, say for a free particle, it would just be um, Q and P. And so at each point in phase space, we have a, um, a Hilbert space and um, we can describe our system by a point in phase space tensored with a quantum state. Um, and more generally, we can have a density matrix. So we have a, um, uh, a density matrix where we have a probability density that the particle lives at a particular point in phase space. And then given that the particle lives at this particular point in phase space, we have a density matrix representing the quantum system. So I've represented it here. Here is the um, the, the, the probability density that the particle um, can be found at a particular point in phase space. And then given that that particle lives at a particular point in phase space, we have a, this two by two density matrix. Right, and so um, the qu classical quantum state I represent by um, here rho hat, and rho is the classical um, phase space probably density, and then I have this two by two density matrix. So that's what I mean by a classical quantum system. Um, 
Does anyone have any question about how we're representing classical quantum systems? Because I think that's important. You can think of it just like, um, if you want to think of it embedded in a fully quantum space, you can think of it like we have these two um, tensor power Hilbert spaces, and then we consider only separable states which live between the two. So just to compare classical quantum mechanics and classical quantum mechanics, in classical systems, we have a density matrix, that, which tells it tells me the probability density of being at a point in phase space. And this density has to be positive and it has to integrate to one. Um, quantum systems, we have a positive matrix, which has trace one. And now the classical quantum state has now Z, I'm using Z to represent phase space. We have the probability density of living at a point in phase space and a density matrix sigma hat, um, which depends on that point in phase space. And if I now integrate over phase space and take the trace of this CQ state, then that should be one, okay? So we have, a, it needs to be, just like classical mechanics and, and quantum mechanics, this thing has to be positive and normalized. Jonathan. Yes. Um, just to help the discussion, maybe I, I ask a question because I'm, I'm not very clear either. Um, so, if it's going to be classical, there's going to be no commuting variables in the description of the state. Is is there is that the case? And is there a way we see this from these formulas you have on the screen? Sorry, so the quantum system is just described as an an ordinary quantum system. So the observables on it are any set of any any operators um, on the quantum system. So so I right. can perform any measurement on the quantum system. And what's more, that measurement could depend on the point in phase space. So I can ask, where is the particle in phase space? And given where the particle is on phase space, I can perform any measurement, for example, on the quantum system. I see. So this is how you put together a classical and a quantum system. Right. right. And I don't think there's any other way to do so. So, um, you know, the, in some sense, if I think of uh, maybe the, the nice example I'll use is um, a, a spin half particle um uh which has a, a classical position and momentum so it is a you know a two by two density matrix representing the spin a half particle but then it can be found at any point in phase space and um its density matrix uh representing its spin will depend on where it is in phase space yeah it's okay so here we have um i've, I've given our um spin a half particle um so there's a um a, a here, it can be at any point Z in phase space, and then condition on it being at a point in phase space, it's either a zero or a one, and then it has some coherences with the off-diagonal elements. Um, excuse me, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, I, I have uh, a clarification question. Can sure. you talk a bit more, why do you think, if why you only consider uh, separable states? Because you hinted that you think that this is the only consistent way to do it. Right. I guess I don't. I want that the classical system remains classical, meaning I need positive. It needs to be a positive density matrix. So, for example, if I conditioned on finding the system at a particular point in phase space, um, mm -hmm. I need to have a positive density matrix, and so that somehow gets you there. I guess okay. I would say that, uh, that one of the things about a classical system is it it has a definite uh, Q and P in phase space. And so that means that it has to be separable. Okay, I see. Um, all right, thanks. So by, by the definition of what it means to be classical, you can only have um, separable states between the classical and quantum system. Okay, and this definition, can you give us a reference on like to... Um, and it actually, a bit more. I think it may arise from um, um, Alexandrov, um, who came up with this Alexandrov bracket. I think it might arise from that. Okay, uh, I'll have so a look. So it's quite an ancient way of doing it. I, I, I think, you know, I don't know that there's any, I don't think there's any other way. I'm not sure if he was the first person to do it, but I think that he, he does do it. So I suspect it goes before then. That's good enough. Thank you. Um, here's a here I've written um, a classical quantum state in a purely quantum um, uh, formalism. So, for example, I have a particular probability density of having um, 
of being, uh, you know, I have a, diag a diagonal matrix in the classical distribution Z here um, that, you know, you have no coherence whatsoever. Um, and that's another way of representing a classical system. So this is uh, a, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I see. Like you have embedded the classical system in, in, in a the quantum, quantum system, system that's right. and you consider only a separable states. That's right, because because the classical system is in a definite state. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Okay, and now there's now now we want to consider dynamics, and we've been able to come up with uh, we've done it in three different ways. We have a path integral approach, which is what I'll be talking about here. We have a trajectories approach, like an unraveling, and we have a master equation. And we've derived the most general master equation, the most general set of trajectories. And for the path integral, we don't know its most general form, but we've at least found a sufficient um, a path integral, which is sufficient, meaning that the path integral gives rise to completely positive trace preserving dynamics. Um, and why do we demand that the dynamics be completely positive trace preserving? Well, because we have a state space. And as I mentioned, that state space, um, we have to have positive probabilities and uh, the probabilities have to sum to one. And so your dynamics must preserve that. So it must preserve the positivity of this um, classical quantum object. It must preserve the norm. So we, we say completely positive norm preserving. Um, and then finally, it must be linear and it must be linear um, in order to respect the statistical interpretation of the density matrix. Um, it's something we can talk about later, but essentially we want that our system behaves well on probability distributions. Okay, so now is the fun part. I'm going to compare path integrals, um, quantum path integrals, classical path integrals, and classical quantum path integrals. So here's the quantum path integral um, you'll all be familiar with. Um, I have some, um, I just take the, if I want to compute the amplitude, um, for example, that the particle has an initial um, state psi i and goes to some final state, then I can compute the amplitude by summing over all paths, which um, have as the endpoints, the initial state and the final state. That's just the Feynman path integral. Um, now I can take this path integral and I can, instead of talking about the amplitude, I can um, talk about a density matrix. Um, and so I can compute probabilities um, directly. So for, what I do is I have now um, the original amplitude here, which is starting from an initial state to a final state. But I, in addition to the um, ket field, I have a bra field. So I look at the bra and I evolve it to some final state, which can be different. And in this way, I'm in some sense um, writing a path integral formalism for density matrices. So here I have a, I've doubled the number of fields. I have a bra field and a ket field. Um, and this will allow me to start off with some initial pure state and look at what the final density matrix is. Carlo? You know, here by state, you mean a peculiar class of states, which are the eigenstates of the sort of classical variable in the path integral, is that correct? No, no, this, so this is any, quant so um, so here's the, the normal path integral. So I can start with any state oh, I yeah, want. It's, it's here I did not understand. So okay. do you mean any state? Yeah, any state. So I, I have an initial yeah. state at, uh, so I, so at I time. Don't time. What is the meaning of this D phi? What is the meaning of a path integral over states? I've never seen this. I've seen a well, path I, for classical trajectories, not over states. Yeah, it's trajectory. So, field. so I guess let's take this to be a field, a, a field configuration, and I take the path over all fields. Or Q, like if you wanted to treat, look at just a, a particle. Q and Sorry. P. So I take the sum over all Q and P. You mean you mean the position at every time, right? Suppose this is just a quantum mechanic with a single particle. Yes. You mean okay. the position at every time. Yes. So phi i is a position of some time. So it's not could, a it, state at some time. Sorry? It's not a generic quantum state at some times. It's an eigenstate of the position. It's a position value. Well, I you know, normally what you do is you would start off with some arbitrary state. And then I can now decompose it in terms of all possible paths in terms of my, say, Qs and Ps by just inserting a bunch of identities and in, inserting projectors onto Q and P. No, um, so those are my paths. So, so, so we can start with some okay, initial state here. Yeah, it, it, let's suppose I do it I'm constantly confused by your notation. Phi I, it's a gene it's, this is just a quantum mechanics in one dimension. We all know what you're talking about, right? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Oh. 
phi i is just the position, is x, not psi of x. That's right. That's so, right. Here, here I, because I'm going okay. to field. So if, so if you want it to be dq, dq dot, um, so or just dq, then we could do it like that. Yeah. So, so phi is not a quantum state. It's just the value of a classical variable. That's right. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. what was confusing. Okay. Sorry, I'm. Uh, uh, I just meant the, the ordinary. I just meant the ordinary path integral. So just the ordinary final path integral. Yes, which is not a sum over states. That's the point. It's a sum of classical. Yes, I values. did. I say state. Okay, I'm not sure if yes, I if, over, I, if over, I said over, states, then I if I said states. States over and okay. over. Again. That's what was confusing me. Sorry, now. I... Okay, my my apologies. So, um, I mean over paths. Thanks. Um, and uh, again, if we want to to compute the density matrix, we have some. Um, initial state, I'll say state here, but we sum over all paths. Um, but but here we can sum over the bra paths and the ket paths um, and therefore arrive at a density matrix. So we have the action for the bra and the action for, sorry, the action for the ket and the action for the bra. All right, so this is just doubling of the degrees of freedom to get us um, um, a density matrix, a path integral for the density matrix. So this is fairly fa uh, standard. It's called the you know Feynman-Vernon approach. Um, or the Schwinger Keldish approach, and um, we can write it like this. So this will this will um, allow us to determine, say, the density matrix at some final time, and the plus phi and the minus phi are um, are um, the final states. I'm going to use the. I do use them interchangeably. You're right, Carlo. But I. I <laughs> um. And good. And so we can we can also add in uh, we can consider um, pure states going to mixed states by adding in this Feynman Vernon term, which acts to decohere, um, uh, which acts, for example, here in the, uh, to pr to provide decoherence. So um, you can actually see that this Feynman Vernon term looks very similar, like a Lindblad term, if you think of the Lindblad equations. And you can write it like this, for example. And what it does is it suppresses paths for which the um, bra field and the ket field are different. So if the bra field and the ket field are are um, different, then um, you get a suppression, and the suppression is like decoherence because it's uh, an off-diagonal element. So when the bra field, when the the value of the bra field is different to the value of the ket field, that is like an off-diagonal element, and that will be suppressed by this Feynman-Vernon term, and when the bra field is equal to the ket field, that's like the diagonal elements of the density matrix, and then this term doesn't do anything. Okay, so this is just a standard open quantum systems path integral. Um, but it contains this additional decoherence term called the Feynman-Vernon term. Good. And um, let's now go to classical mechanics. So in classical mechanics, the path integral is very boring for um, deterministic classical mechanics because it's just a delta function. There's only one path, and so we take the path, um, and there's only one possible path, and so it's a bunch of delta functions um, at each time step, and that is the very boring classical path integral. Um, but if we have a stochastic theory, then there are different paths, and they will contribute to um, the probability density. So we can, for example, imagine that initially we have a particle which is at a particular point in phase space, Q and P. We want to know what is the um, probability density of it going to a final point in space, phase space. And this um, can be uh, uh, um, determined by this path integral called an Onsager match loop path integral. Um, and what you see here is that you have, um, before we had a delta function around the Heisenberg equations, sorry, the Hamilton's equations, but here um, we only suppress, um, we allow for um, solutions or paths which do not satisfy Hamilton's equations, but they are suppressed. So if they deviate too much from Hamilton's equation, so here we have a stochastic force. So the force is on average given by um, um, Hamilton's equations, but we are allowed deviations, but those deviations are suppressed by this extra term here. Okay, so this is um, a stochastic path integral. Does anyone have any questions about the stochastic path integral? Um, I have probably uh, naive again, but it's important, I guess, we get it right. <clears throat> yeah. 
So I'm a bit confused with the delta because it seems like you're imposing the equations of motion, but in the path integral, we have things that are off shell. Um, so is that what these delta functions that you had in the previous one, the usual one, it seems like they were imposing equations of motion. But yeah, they are. So this is a classical deterministic path integral. So in the, in the for a deterministic system, we are imposing the equations of motion. And so we only have one of them. No, but in a path integral, you integrate over paths that do not satisfy the equations of motion. Yes, in the quantum path integral. So this is a classical. So I'm saying in classical um, mechanics, class you can also um, write down a path integral. Yes, it's sorry, a very so boring one. And it, uh, the, there's only one path. Got it. So this is a path integral description of classical mechanics. Okay, thanks. Um, and th this is also a path integral for classical mechanics, but it's a stochastic theory where I, this is for Brownian motion. So I have Brownian motion or a, a Fokker-Planck-like equation where I have the force, but I have stochastic fluctuations to the force and they are suppressed, but they exist. And so you can write this path integral. You have introduced two constant, right? D D one and D two. One that says how much uh, decayers, and one says how much is the sto stochastic force. Is that correct? that's right? That's right. So far, so in the quantum path integral, I introduce introduced the D D zero, which was how much decoherence yeah. I have, and here I've introduced a D two, which is how much diffusion um, I have, which controls um, how much I'm suppressing the paths which deviate from Hamilton's equation. Thanks. I appreciate the questions, um, so so keep them coming. Um, okay, so now let's just compare them in one slide. We have the quantum path integral, which has um, a bra field action, a ket field action, and then a coupling action, which acts to suppress off diagonal, which provides decoherence and acts to um, suppress um, terms where the bra field and the ket field are very different. So that's like suppressing off diagonal elements. And the further apart they are, the more they get suppressed here. We have a classical um, path integral, um, which looks like a Brownian motion. So we have this classical path integral where we have the Hamilton's equation for the force, but um, we allow for deviations from that force law, um, as, but they are suppressed and they are suppressed by an amount, which is controlled by D2. And now we're going to combine them so into this classical quantum path integral. So we have the ordinary quantum um, path integral, which has this Feynman-Vernon term. Um, so we have some decoherence. Um, and now we have what looks a little bit like this classical path integral. Um, so we have this stochastic force. But um, we are going to, rather than just, uh, you know, we can't source it with we don't know what to source it with, so we'll source it with both the bra field and the ket field. So um, we kind of take the average of both of them. So we have a stochastic force, and the stochastic force is determined both by the bra field and the ket field. And we have a decoherence, which um, decoheres the quantum system um, in the case, uh, and it, it serves to decohere the, for, the, the, you know, the quantum system um, um, by an amount which depends on how different the force that it's producing is. Um, are there any questions about this? You might. It, it takes some looking at, I think, but yeah. notice the similarity between here's the Feynman-Vernon term and here's the Fokker-Planck term, but just with a slight difference that we source it with both the bra field and the ket field. In the uh, 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 stop me if I'm over stepping. Right? You don't. I don't want to. No, this is great. This is great. So this is a you, you're taking this as, um, I mean the two the two terms uh, uh, in the previous examples were both interpreted usually as a uh, effective description of something else which we're not describing. Mm -hmm. How are you taking this as an effective description of something else which you're not describing, or are you taking this as sort of a, a new a new law of nature of some kind? Good, uh, it's a good question. So. Um... So here I'm I'm treating it as a uh, well. So I think one could do both. Um, and with Isaac Layton, we've um, we've looked at the question of when does this arise as an effective theory. So you can ask when will we get some e equations which look like this if we have two quantum systems and we take the what we call a, it's kind of a, a limit, a classical quantum limit where one of my systems is classical. When will these equations of motion arise? 
And we find that um, they do arise in some limit, um, but um, they uh, th the parameters are different. So you could, in some sense, distinguish between a fundamental classical quantumness and a fund and a, an effective classical quantumness. So you are just proposing this as a correction to the Schrodinger equation, to the Newton equation, to all equations of physics. Is that right? Well, it, uh, so um, yeah, I'm, uh, okay. Well, I. I, just, I, just, I think what's most interesting is I'm proposing it as a fundamental um, equation where the um, space-time is, is, is fundamentally classical and matter fields remain quantum. So there it's, a, it's proposed as a fundamental theory. Now you can also be interested in it as an effective theory. If we believe that we have a quantum theory of gravity, then you might be interested in the limit where space-time behaves classically. So this, this equation will also, given certain conditions, be an effective theory. Um, I have uh, another question, Jonathan, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, on it's just to understand like this uh, classical stochastic force that you have. So mm -hmm. if you could go one slide back, that it's maybe it's better. Sorry. Um, is there a particular reason why you suppress one of the equations of motion, not the other? Like, yeah. Why so do you... you suppress like p? Uh, dot and not q dot yeah so it's interesting to not suppress the other one um i've called um i don't know if there's a w word for it but i've called these sorts of um suppress like if we only suppress one equation of motion if only one is stochastic i've called that brownian um you can also imagine um allowing the other one and if you allow a stochastic q then what you then in some sense you don't have a, a good definition of what p is um, you can only define p in, in terms of expectation values. So this actually looks very quantum if you have both a stochastic q and a stochastic p. Um, mm -hmm. But it's no longer, I would say, a classical theory. It's it's now some weird theory where you can only define the momentum in terms of some expectation values of q. Okay. All right. Thanks. But I think it's interesting to look at such theories. I, I, I don't know that there's much mm -hmm. literature on that. Okay. I also have a quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. About the h and h hat that are appearing here, and h plus and h minus, could you briefly say something about these? Are they the same thing, or yeah? So just a reminder: the um, so we have the bra field and the ket field. We're calling plus and minus, and so here this would be the Hamiltonian with the bra field and the Hamiltonian with the ket field. Um, so it's like the you know I'll go to an example of a spin half particle, um, and then maybe it will be a bit more clear. But um, in a stern gerlach experiment. You know, you um, uh, the there'll be a force produced by the spin of the particle, and here we're distinguishing. Um, you know, if if the bra field, if the if the bra spin is up or down, that will produce a different force, and if the ket field is up or down, that will. Uh, so we're taking the average of the bra field and the ket field. So that's that's h applied to phi plus that's right. cat. Right. Well, this is in a path integral, right? So it's so you're just treating it as an. Oh, good. I see. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. yeah. Good. Good. So the notation is strange. I guess I should. It, the, the hat is maybe a strange notation. Um, uh -huh. I maybe shouldn't have had it here because we're in the path integral. Okay. If that, okay. Yeah. So maybe maybe we'll come back here with an example. I guess. Yeah, but I guess if you go to the uh, master equation, then it would be the Hamiltonian applied to the bra field or the Hamiltonian applied to the ket field. And then when we have them in the path integral, they're just the Hamiltonian of the bra field, the Hamiltonian of the ket field. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, so um, like I said, we have a path integral, a trajectories approach or a master equation approach. And let me, um, because we're running out of time, let me um, give the Stern-Gerlach, okay, as an example, and then we can, I'll just show up the gravitate, uh, well, then we'll see where we're at, um, and I'll, uh, I'm mindful of the time. So um, here's a Stern-Gerlach. We have a Hamiltonian, which is the free particle Hamiltonian, p squared over 2m, plus um, a magnetic field, which I'll take to be linear, and um, the spin of the particle, which is sigma. All right? And what we're going to define, we're going to let's start off our um, quantum system in the plus state. Um, and... If it's spin up, then we expect that the particle will go in one direction. And if it's spin down, it'll go in another direction. 
Um, and um, uh, this is indeed what we find. find. So if you compare that to the semi-classical equations where you would expect it to go down the middle, um, we get equations that I think are kind of sensible. Um, and um, because it's stochastic, so because um, it's jumping around, initially it takes you a while to figure out if it's spin up or spin down, but eventually you figure out whether it's spin up or spin down um, by just monitoring the classical particle. And eventually you see, oh, it's going up here. And so it must be spin uh, zero, it's the zero uh, qubit. And if it goes down here, it's the one qubit. Um, and so this is uh, um, such a system. Um, and so let me write down um, the master equation. So this is the master. So the master equation looks like this. Um, we have the ordinary um, um, Heisenberg term, Heisenberg equation of motion given by the commutator. And now we have the Poisson bracket, but we take the, um, this is sometimes called the Alexandrov bracket. It's the, um, you know, acting on the left and acting on the right. This is the plus field and the minus field. So sometimes it's sourced by the bra, sometimes it's forced, sourced by the ket. And then we have this double commutator, which acts as a kind of diffusion. And we have this double commutator with the um, spin matrix, which acts as a decoherence. And um, there's some, um, in order for the dynamics to be um, completely positive norm preserving, you need to satisfy what we call this decoherence versus diffusion trade-off. Um, and there's a remarkable thing which happens when this trade-off is saturated, which the quantum, which is that the quantum state stays pure. So you can see what happens here is that the quantum state lives, stays on the surface of the block sphere. So it stays pure um, depending on its classical trajectory. So this is a um, stern gerlach spin a half particle and an example. Um, are there any questions about this example? It's another silly question, but isn't the, the commutator symmetric in H and Rho, so if you turn it around, it should be the same. And the anti yes, but I've got the minus right, but it's got a minus sign here. So right, in some so isn't, this uh, is... isn't the anticommutator of H with Rho the same as the anticommutator with Rho with H? And, um, yeah, but I'm well, not because I'm taking. Don't forget, I'm taking. Uh, this is this is not the anticommutator. Sorry, this is a Poisson oh. bracket. So, it's so a Poisson taking, bracket. Sorry, sorry, it's sorry. a Poisson bracket. So sorry, I'm taking sorry, the Poisson sorry, sorry. bracket here. Um, but, it, you know, there's two ways I could imagine this. Well, there's many ways I could imagine that there's an operator ordering ambiguity. So uh, we call this the Homer Simpson method, where we just take the average of both cases that we can think of first. Any more questions about this little example? It's a... Um, <clears throat> so here's well, what it looks like. So you can see that if you know if the spin if the if the if the spin is up on the uh, I always forget which is the bra and which is the ket, but on the one side, then the particle will go up, and if it's on the left side, so if if if, if it's so if for example you have a diagonal density matrix, then it just acts like a stochastic process with the spin on the up or the spin down. But if it has coherences, then it can you know kind of uh, those also play a role. Um, yes, Jonathan, I, I guess what is confusing a bit about the notation is that you have both, um, so these things with the hats describe both a classical and a quantum system, right? So half of the variables are classical. So is it, um, when it, well, for what concerns the classical system? This yeah, so you, I put a hat anytime there's an operator. So um, rho is a bit confusing, but it is it is an operator because it has a density, it has the quantum spin particle inside of it. So. It has a hat because there's an operator, but it also is a functional of or a function of Q and P. Exactly. So in the path integral, the part of H hat that describes the classical system, it's the Hamilton function of the classical system. Well, so the, what, what I guess what happens with the hats when you go to the path integral is that they become pluses or minuses because they refer to the bra field or the ket field. So in the path integral, maybe you can tell if it was an operator because it has a plus or a minus. And I think in my previous slide, I did have a hat, which I shouldn't have. Uh, that's a typo. Um, but otherwise, the cat the, here in the master equation, the cat the, the the hat indicates that it's applied to a quantum system. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you have two constants or three. I just uh, you see, I see, I see the last equation. Do, 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 
D0 equals. Oh, so here I'm taking the saturation. So we call this that when we saturate the trade off, that is when we get this very um, remarkable behavior that the quantum state stays pure the whole yeah, time. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I, I understand D0, I understand D1, uh, the D2. Oh, and D1 is the D1 force is in some sense, it's, it's, it's the force of the back reaction. Right. So understand. So you have three. I mean, if I want, in, in the case in which I want to think as a, as a, as an effective description of something else, you have three things here. So D one is actually the real coupling between the two things. Yes. D two is uh, it's a, uh, it's an effective description of the which one? D two and D zero is effective description of the uh, the coherence and the and the and the and the diffusion. Is that correct? So am, am I right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. A, a priori, the problem is just three constants here. That's that's right. Um, well, well, I guess I would say that if you are trying to explain a particular um, interaction, then D one is determined. So you know, in, yeah, in I gravity. No, I, got, I get this. I get this. So and you, so then, um, D one is. And then, if you say, if you believe that, this, and so it turns out that we can only prove that the path integral is completely positive when we saturate the trade off, and so then you're left with only one, um, one parameter. Would you? If if you allow, would you uh, suppose, would I be wrong if I think in this way? D1 is just a physical coupling between two systems as a mm -hmm. fact. Yeah. Um, and then once I fix D1, I have just only one parameter. And can I interpret this parameter as sort of uh, how many times I make a measurement, uh, how frequent I make a measurement, something like that? Because that's somehow what's going on in a sense. Yeah, um, I think I think you there's a um, yeah I think that, I think there's a sense when you where, yeah if you imagine for example um, and, and um, I, I think it's difficult to, for some systems to look like this but in a, a very simple system like maybe this one you could think of it like you're weakly measuring yeah weakly um, I mean yeah, you're so weakly so measuring the spin. And then your feet. So, so th this is, for example, an approach that people have looked at, like uh, Caffrey, Taylor, Milburn, and um, Diyoshi and Tilloy, where they imagine that someone weakly measures the quantum system and then feeds it into um, uh, um, a yeah. classical equation of motion. And then, you, and then, the, yeah, then the d zero is like how weakly you're measuring it, and d two is how much stochasticity you what have. Is related to the gravity Rimini Weber parameter. Um, Already. Yes, I think that's I think D2 D0 would be indeed. Yeah. yeah. But um you know, notice that here you can make it as weak as you want. So in GRW, for example, if you imagine it as which which I think is not the right, you know, not the, the approach that I, I I find that troubling. But if you tr if you think of it like um that there is some other field which is measuring it, which I, I don't think you I, here it's the gravitational field. But if you want to think of an external object measuring, then yes, D0 would be like your weak measurement. Like the, but but here you can make it as weak as you want. There's no re, uh, there's no reason to make it large. Whereas in a in like say GRW, you have to make it large in order to account for destroying superposition. Got it. I'm following. Good. Okay. So I think um, how am I for time? I, I so the things I could talk about and I could stop is I was going to talk about this trade off, which we've kind of been talking a little bit right now anyway. And then I was going to th throw up the equations of motion, but um, how are we for time? So I think I think seeing as we've been having like a longer conversations uh, as you go through, yeah, I think feel free to take some more time to talk us through this. Okay. Uh, so maybe uh, well, I guess we've been going. Uh, how how long do you think you would uh, have roughly? I could I could do it in maybe five to ten minutes. Oh yeah yeah great yeah. ten minutes let's say. Sounds great. Uh, okay. Um, so, as we were just discussing, there's this D0 parameter, which governs how much decoherence you have. There's this D2, which governs how much diffusion you have in the classical system. And let's just, we will, you know, D1 in this case is going to be gravity, so we don't have any choice about D1. And now we um, find that in order for the dynamics of any interaction, so any classical quantum coupling um, has to satisfy this trade-off, which is that... Um, it has to satisfy this trade-off, and I'm now going to just discuss that from a physical point of view, and then we're going to propose an experiment based on that. Um, and the nice thing is that you can derive this trade-off from very um, well, just uh, for uh, for any theory um, that it, 
where you have a fundamental classical degree of freedom. And I'm going to give a little bit of an intuition about it based on this. Um, I guess it's an example really that comes from Feynman and Yakir Aronov um, um, about um, who gave arguments about why we um, should quantize the gravitational field. And their argument is as follows. Imagine we do a double slit experiment with the moon or a heavy particle. Um, and we will see an interference experiment. So let's take gold atoms instead of the moon if we want. We will see an interference experiment. Um, but while we're doing the interference experiment, we can imagine that someone comes up with a pendula or a, a balance and tries to measure the gravitational field and to measure which slit the particle goes through. So for example, I sit there with a little pendula and measure the gravitational field. And because the gravita if the gravitational field is classical, then I can measure the gravitational field to arbitrary accuracy, and then it won't disturb the system um, because it's classical. Um, and so I could um, I could get which path information, um, and there therefore I should not have an interference pattern. So that was the argument of Feynman and Aronoff and others. Um, is there any question about that um, thought experiment? Good. So, so the same thing happens to some extent in the quantum case, right? So in the quantum case, you can ask what happens with the electromagnetic field. I can measure the electromagnetic field um, and use that to determine um, which which path the electron took. Um, um, and so when the um, particle goes through the left slit, it has a different, um, you know, and after it, say, hit the hit the, the screen here, um, it leaves the electromagnetic field in a different state depending on when it, whether it went through this, the right slit or the left slit. Um, but the point is that the uh, for the electromagnetic field, once the particle has reached the, um, reached the screen, um, the electromagnetic fields in both cases are have a very large overlap. And so if we were to compute the overlap of the electromagnetic field, we find that it has a large overlap. And so there's a lot of coherence here. Um, and so we an interference pattern, even though the electromagnetic field can be left in a different state depending on whether the particle goes through the left slit or the right slit. Um, so that's what happens in the quantum case. The difference is that in the classical case, right, in the classical case, um, um, we can measure, uh, you, you, in the classical case, you cannot have two distinct classical configurations which have a large overlap. All right, because if I have two distinct states, then I could distinguish them with arbitrary precision because they're classical. And so I can determine which slit the particle went through. So that was the argument about why we should quantize the gravitational field. Um, the reason that this theory does not um, suffer um, uh, from this thought experiment um, is that um, it's a stochastic theory where the gravitational field is produced stochastically. So the gravitational field will be left in a different probability distribution of possible configurations, depending on whether the particle went through the left slit or the right slit. And those different probability distributions are not distinguishable, just like two quantum states can be distinct but not distinguishable. And so if the particle goes through the left slit, say, I'm depicting this in a kind of vague way here with some probability distributions over momentum, um, if the particle goes to the left slit, it produces a, a different classical probability distribution, which as time goes on, um, those two different probability distributions become more and more distinct because, you know, eventually I collect enough information, even though these are different distributions, eventually as this particle is um, going along this path, it's um, creating, you know, it's pushing the gravitational field in a particular direction more and more. And so if I wait a long enough time, I will eventually learn whether it went through the left slit or the right slit. Um, and so um, if I have a long coherence time here represented by tau, if I have a long coherence time, and if this box is very long, then I will need to have a lot of diffusion and stochasticity in the gravitational field in order to still have an interference pattern because if the coherence time is long, then I really should not be able to distinguish these two probability distributions. And so the amount of diffusion has to be very large. So that is the uh, kind of physics behind this trade-off between the decoherence and the diffusion. The longer the coherence time, the more diffusion I need. Is there a question about this trade-off? 
I put here the force because in some sense, this is the force of the quantum particle on the classical field. And if the force is very large, then I need a, a more diffusion in order to mask the effect of the force. So just like the Stern-Gerlach, if the force that the spin half particle produces on the particle, so if, if, the, if the force that the spin half um, the magnetic field produces onto the particle is very large, then I will need a lot of zigzag in the path of the particle in order for me to not know whether the particle is spin up or spin down. So that's why there's this triple trade-off between the back the force of the Biak reaction, the amount of coherence, and the amount of diffusion. And so what we propose essentially is that we go out and look for, um, via say a Cavendish experiment, look for this diffusion in the gravitational field and by a double slit experiment, we place a bound on the coherence time. And um, because there's this trade-off, every experiment we do somehow gives us you know, experimental data, which helps squeeze out these theories. And it's you know, possible that if we can um, put a lower bound on uh, the coherence time and a good upper bound on um, the amount of diffusion, then we will be able to say squeeze out any theory in which gravity is fundamentally classical. So that's the um, proposal, the experimental proposal to do um, high precision Cavendish experiments and high precision uh, long coherence times for heavy molecules like, um, sorry, dense molecules like gold um, in order to squeeze out such theories. And in fact, we already find some theories ruled out. Um, and so I'm going to flash up the GR thing. I've given you kind of the the, the spin a half particle, um, but GR is you know more complicated. But you can write down um, the action for it here, um, and uh, I will just end with just mentioning some of the. There's a, the I would say that this is a, a kind of a program which is is well underway, but there are things which still need to be um, understood and checked. And I will just mention um, things like, you know, we need to make sure that um, any anomalous heating is not too much, that it doesn't violate experimental bounds. Um, there's some question on um, whether there's a tension between the the theory of being completely positive trace preserving and um, and and it's uh, w whether it's generally covariant. We we believe that tension is now resolved, but it is. Um, I think there's still checks which have to be done on that. Um, and I should say we've found that it's renormalizable, which is very exciting. Um, and so, uh, with that, I think I would like to, uh, just finish by saying, you know, there's, I think a, a valid, a, a reasonable question you can ask is space time classical. Um, I think I would say, well, we have no idea, but it, it could be, and there's, and, and I think that this is an interesting enough theory uh, and, and a well-developed enough theory that um, we ought to be, you know, this is now an experimental question rather than a theoretical one. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. That's, that's great. Thanks. Uh, thank you very, very much for the really interesting talk. That was great. Uh, I can see we've already got uh, a lot of questions. Uh, so let me see. I think the first one I saw go up was from uh, Andrea. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, for the talk, it was very, very clear. I, I learned a lot actually today. Um, I have a comment and a question. Uh, I'll ask the question because I think it's easier, and, uh, and I also say the comment. So um, about the about the only this being the only way of combining a classical and quantum system, um, there is this whole framework called the generalized probabilistic theories that people use in foundations of quantum mechanics to look at like the space of theories. Uh, and there they they do they have characterizations of um, of classical systems and different ways of combining systems. So for sure there is something there. I don't know if you have looked at it. I asked uh, Emanuele Panella when I met him about it, and uh, he seemed interested. Seemed like to have thought about it a little bit, but uh, he didn't know if. Like my question is: Is there a relation between what you're doing and this GPT framework, or not? Um. Sorry, this is me trying to uh, see if I can get a camera going. Um, I would say that the GPT framework is a 
So I, I I feel like I've asked a fairly narrow question. I'm looking at theories which are classical and qu and quantum. You can ask about more general uh, frameworks which exist, and I think that's an interesting question. I don't personally know of any that are um, where we have an interesting dynamics or anything like that. So I think that that is um, um, an issue. So I guess that's why why I'm interested. So I, I was very interested in these GPTs, but because I've not seen one that has uh, valid dynamics, I guess this to me seems like an easier question. Like, can we have a classical quantum theory? No, sure, sure. Now, to clarify, I was really specifically talking about uh, they have formulated ways of combining quantum and classical systems. And I was just curious if somehow there was a relation to it, to the way that you are doing it in your program, not about more post-quantum other stuff. I understand that you are formulating a specific theory, and that's the kind of appeal of your thing. But just because you mentioned this is the only way to couple a classical to quantum system, um, yeah, I believe that's the case. I, I think in the are... general probabilistic framework, it allows you to consider other kinds of um, theories which are neither classical nor quantum, but I don't think it gives you um, an additional way to... I mean, it can give you an additional formalism to describe quantum theory and an additional formalism to describe classical theory, but it, it's it's an equivalent formalism. Okay. Okay, cool. Good. And then just as a comment about the initial, I don't know, it's maybe it's risky to bring back the initial the initial point that Carlo raised about the the statistical mixture versus uh, the quantum mm -hmm. mixture. But this is basically the page Geilker experiment, right? When if I believe that uh, quantum mechanics is unitary and I do and I do a quantum a gravity experiment depending on the outcome of a qubit measurement, then semi-classical gravity tells me something that I don't observe. And I think even if it's because like uh, when I do a quantum measurement, I describe this eventually as a decohered superposition, right. but it's still a real superposition and somehow semi-classical gravity still fails. Yeah, so I would agree. Right. So, so I totally agree with you that, yeah, so I, I would totally agree with you that Paige Geiger has ruled out semi-classical, the semi-classical equations. Right. And that's maybe one of the reasons I don't consider such. Great. Okay. Um, so next we have uh, Fran Francisco, I believe. Um, yes. Thank you very much. I have a question. I'm not sure if this. So in in a in a theory like this, um, would we expect to have a, a Bell inequality violations if the detector dependent on the gravitational degrees of freedom, for example, say. You have uh, um, uh, the the Cavendish torsion balance, right? And uh, different outcomes would correspond with the, with the, with the, correspond to different configurations of the big spheres, right? And uh, then we'd expect maybe some collapse before that happening, and maybe we would not have cosmic violations there. I'm not sure about that. No. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm being clear here. Can you hear me now if I use this phone? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, you, you still get, you know, the quantum system is still quantum. You still get a violation of a Bell inequalities from the quantum system. Um, so that hasn't changed at all. The results of a Bell measurement could be written into the gravitational field. So in some sense, you know, because... Uh, so you so you can get a bell violation within the gravitational field the gravitational field itself can produce a bell violation because it can't have entanglement so you can't have entanglement between the classical field and the quantum field so you can't violate a bell inequality between those two things but you can have you know just ordinary entanglement and therefore violate a bell inequality and the results of those measurements can be written into the gravitational field so in that sense you can but i don't think this theory tells you anything more about bell's inequality than we had previously. And, you know, these experiments like uh, the ones that uh, Sugato Bose has proposed and his group have proposed and um, um, Marletto and Bedrell, those ones are, are, you know, this this theory would 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 not be able to create entanglement. And so um, that's another set of experimental proposals that one could use to test the quantum nature of this or to test this theory or the quantum nature of the gravitational field. Okay. Another question is just uh, when you say that it remains pure when there's that desaturation. What what's the meaning of this of remaining pure? Is like the two things 
uh, um, yeah. Yeah, it's very strange. I mean, if I look at, I, so I I find it very strange. It, it, but essentially, if I monitor the classical de- degree of freedom, then conditioned on the classical degree of freedom, the quantum state stays pure. So, in some sense, there is no decoherence. Um, th- there's no decoherence um, on the conditional quantum state, but there is decoherence um, if I were to say trace out the gravitational field. It's like kind of like many worldly kind of thing. We have the two things, and you don't know. You are unsure which one is happening. And... No, I, I don't. Well, I don't think it speaks to that. Um, it just says, you know. So it, what's strange is that this theory was predicated on the fact that somehow we need to consider a stochastic theory in which we have mixed states. And at the end of the day, it is still a stochastic theory. So there's an, a breakdown of predictability, but that predict breakdown of predictability is can be, if you saturate this trade-off, is purely in the, in the classical degree of freedom. So the, the, you have no predictability um, in, the, in how, well, you have, you have a breakdown in predictability in the classical degree of freedom, but, but there's a loss, so there's a loss of classical information, or, but there's no loss of quantum information in, this, in the sense that if I monitor the classical degree of freedom, I will know exactly what state the quantum system is in. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, so next, uh, Eugenio. Hi, Jonathan. Yeah, Hi. So, uh, I have a question about uh, if you have checked or explored uh, uh, cosmological perturbations. <laughs> so have you tried in this framework uh, to look at, uh, uh, at gravitational uh, cosmological perturbations, tensor modes, and see what kind of uh, power spectrum for tensor modes would arise. And I have a follow-up, uh, but I want to hear first about this. Um, so we've considered cosmological um, perturbations, but not uh, not what not the, what you're considering. So we haven't looked at the scalar tensor mode. Um, but yeah, you can ask, you know, what happens in a in a in a cosmological setting. I mean, I guess what's nice now is I think there's a, a complete enough theory. Um, uh, that you can now look at, say, subsets of space times and ask what happens. And I think obviously things like inflation is a natural, a very natural place to look because that's, uh, you know, in some sense, in in the semi classical approach, you kind of need to put in some deco. You can only do things when you have decohered your system. So you we, once you've decohered the classical system into different space times, um, then you can um, ask what happens. But here, I guess you can go beyond that. So I guess that's the advantage of this approach. Now, whether, okay. you know, what, 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 what experimental predictions you can make from that, I think, is another question. And, and I think that has to be investigated. OK, so this is a calculation to be done now, if I understand correctly. Yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. Yeah, because one could argue that uh, if one observes uh, tensor modes with a certain power spectrum, uh, that is the one predicted uh, by having a quantum state for uh, for the gravitational perturbations. That's evidence for those being quantum. And mm-hmm. so, would you consider that as a test of uh, this proposal? Uh, I, it's a good question. I haven't thought about it enough to to know the answer to that. But I mean, I think I would be interested in the answer. <laughs> it feels like a good answer. A good question. I mean, I guess I would say that I feel like there's you know I, I've yet to see a um, I would. I've yet to see an ex, um, a signature of quantumness. Well, of quantumness of the actual gravitational field versus quantumness of the of the vacuum state, or say something like this. Yeah, that's why I was formulating it uh, uh, not as a signature, but uh, uh, if you start from uh, uh, the standard perturbative framework for gravity, you have a prediction for the for the power spectrum, and so the question is. That are there some set of initial conditions or initial configurations that would give you uh, one power spectrum? Can you compare it uh, with observations? And I think what's interesting there is that uh, we haven't seen yet tensor modes, but we have seen scalar modes and temperature anisotropies. And so one can already test this idea against uh, data that are there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Great, Uh, are you cool? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for the right, talk. Uh, so, can I ask you? Um, I I feel I didn't get exactly 
what is the crucial change that you have made that you feel has made the two has rendered the two uh, theories consistent with each other uh, that or has rendered the classical quantum theory consistent i didn't i i don't feel i can put like pinpoint what's the exact change that has happened that has made things consistent now right i think it's this it's a stochasticity so it's the fact that um i don't have a determine so that the quantum back reaction does not you know is, does not determine the state of the classical system because if if we have if it's deter if the quantum system deterministically um back reacts on the classical system then it would collapse instantly um but because it's stochastic then it doesn't there's no collapse that happens instantly and so we can continue to have superposition so that is the fundamental change i see and then my follow up is how much of this stochasticity is uh, ontological um because whenever it is there in quantum sorry in classical mechanics right. it always due to our ignorance and if we had uh, god's eye uh, yes then uh, there's no randomness at all there's no stochasticity at all at least in, in right classical yeah, I, think, I think so i think that's an interesting question and I, i'm not sure so i think i would say that here it, it appears to be fundamental stochasticity um uh there's some arguments about um you know i in some sense, you can always embed everything into quantum systems, but here I don't know any real way of doing it in a in a way that um, because here you you can know Q and P with certainty, right? You can know Q and P with certainty, and so um, you could embed Q in a different quantum system and P in another quantum system, a separate quantum system. So that but that is kind of a very strange embedding. So you could do such an embedding, um, but um, but. I think if we take away such artificial embeddings, then I think it's um, then you, uh, it, it, it seems that you cannot think of this as a quantum, a fully quantum um, theory where we trace out some environment, and so um, uh, it's somehow there's some fundamental breakdown in predictability here. Now, I think a lot of people don't like that, and um, I think a lot of physicists believe that you know you any everything has a cause, um, but here. Well, there might be a cause, but it would be, I, I guess I called it like a post-quantum soup. It's like neither classical nor quantum. It's something else. So uh, if, if, if it is an environment, it's it's a really, you know, kind of strange one, which obeys no laws like we've seen before. Thank you. Uh, Nateke and uh, Nekati. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the talk. I also learned a lot, like Andrea. Um, I wanted to just ask again, like more or less a clarification uh, question than anything. Um, mm -hmm. It's on the structure of your states, because it was not clear to me uh, exactly how, how it worked. Because what I got is that you have a, a separable state in the sense that you have a classical distribution, and then you have a quantum uh, density matrix. But I don't know if you allow for correlations between the classical and the quantum. Yeah, well, crucially, you have to have correlations, but there's no entanglement. So okay. it's a separable, somehow separable yeah. between the quantum and the classical system. It has to be separable, but you, you need the correlations, but you can't have entanglement. OK, so it's separable, but it's not a product. Right. Not a state. OK, good, good. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. I think we have Marcus. You mean Marius? <laughs> <laughs> the mysterious <Yes>. M. <laughs> I've learned to respond to Marcus. I don't know why this is very common. <laughs> no worries. Um, so I'm just going to repeat the question just to see if I can get the definitive statement from um, Jonathan that um, um, I know you've said already that these are going to be separable states and so on. But so if they do the mediated entanglement experiment, the simple versions, the ones by Bozetal, does that falsify? Well, uh, that would falsify. I mean, if you if you find entanglement, but you can create entanglement, uh, you would falsify the theory. I see. OK, good. Thanks. We, we have you on record now.
<laughs> I can. I've signed a piece of paper, so <laughs> I think. I think what Carlo even mentioned as one of the uh, experiments which were decided. So. One, one was 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 in a in a um, joint document to the to the document. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you do the computation, or or you were just claiming it? Uh, well, because for me, it's not clear. It's, it's not clear at all. Point, well, it's it? a classical system, right? So it's a local theory. So it's a local theory. And it's a classical system. So just by you can't create entanglement under LOCC, you have it that it, you can't create entanglement using the gravitational field. But is it local in what sense? Oh, relativistic locality. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but this are this is not necessarily what uh, implies in LOCC. There's no. It's not about relativistic locality. It's about uh, locality at the level of uh, the subsystems. Yeah. Well. So here you have just you know. I mean, I can write a theory which is not, but here the 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 back reaction is with field. So the field, the field, the quantum field at the location x um, back reacts on the gravitational field at the point x. Okay, but you haven't done the computation. I don't You're think there's anything from principles. Okay. Yeah, I don't think there's a computation that needs to be done. I guess. Okay. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't think there is. So there is a, a short. There is a small question, which is you can imagine having a environment which is correlated. And if you interact with this correlated environment, then you could imagine creating entanglement, but then that kind of violates one of the, that, that's, you know, violates one of the tenets of their theorem. So uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I can construct for you a model which does that, but the, the reasonable ones uh, I would argue do not do that. Okay. Thanks. So as an effective theory, you could imagine, but. It would rule out this is a fundamental theory. Uh, Deepak? Yeah, hi, Jonathan. Uh, hi, thanks. Jonathan. thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so my question, I guess, would be that uh, isn't the world quantum? I mean, at all levels, is, isn't that, that what we commonly understand and accept what are you saying i mean because because and 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 i mean leaving aside the question of the quantization of the gravitational field for a second uh you know all the other forces are are, are quantum um classical mechanics and classical physics is understood to arise uh, in a suitable limit from an underlying right. quantum theory yeah you know you 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 can build a coherent state description of classical mechanics. So, you know, uh, why, why would the gravitational field maintain some sort of classicality? Like, what would be the explanation? Yeah. Good. So I think it's a good question. Um, I, I think I have, let me give you two answers. So one answer is just the question of like, is it plausible that it's that it is the gravitational field is different? And I think if you believe in that that it's you know that it's geometric. If we if we if we treat the geometric nature of gravity as somehow that it's special, that it's different to the other forces because it alone represents some universal geometry in which all matter fields live. If you if you treat the geometric nature of gravity seriously, then I think it's reasonable, very reasonable, to say, well, it could be different to the other forces. It might not be mediated by bosons. It may be, um, you know, it's it's geometry, and geometry is different to matter. Um, and you can take the other view that okay, this is just a coincidence that we can uh, treat it as a universal geometry, and uh, th this geometric picture is just a you know a coincidence, and then. You know, you might think we can quantize it, and I, I'm open to both. I'm not like, uh, uh, you know, I'm not evangelical. Um, I think it's, it's, but I think it's a reasonable question to ask. Uh, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a. I think the gravitational field has re there are reasons we can think of the gravitational field as different. Um, now, with this new renormalization result, which we have, where we where we see that it's renormalizable, then I think you have like a positive answer to okay, well. You know, uh, ordinary quantum gravity perturbatively turned out to be not renormalizable, but this theory is renormalizable. So then you, you then you might have a bit more of a balance that I think to uh, like a positive reason why you might imagine, you know, to uh, positive evidence that this is, you know, that space time is fundamentally classical. 
Um, the other reason I, I might say is that I just, uh, I, yeah, I, I, maybe I'll leave it at that. But I, I also find like, um, you know, because we're talking about the rate at which time flows, um, I think I, I feel that I have difficulty kind of picturing what it, how to do quantum mechanics without this background classical space time um, uh, uh, metric, I guess. Um, I'm not saying, it, 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 you know, I'm not saying that uh, one has to, it's, and I, I think there's, there's, there's good reasons to disagree with me. And I think your reason, like, you know, quantum mechanics all the way down is a reasonable reason to disagree. Um, and I, and I, I'm also sympathetic to that. So I, you know, I, I am quite sympathetic to that as well. So I, I just think it's a reasonable question at, at the moment. And I think there's some positive weight on both sides. But ultimately, experiment will determine. Exactly, that's that's my feeling, and and it's a well developed theory at this point. So I think now it's 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 a, it's a it's a very reasonable question. We have a testable theory, and it's up yeah. to nature. You know, we need to in, uh, interrogate nature, and we, we can have different um, predispositions. But at the end of the day, these are worth nothing. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I think we have a question from Weston. Yep. Uh, hi, Jonathan. Uh, thanks um, for the... Um, just a, it's maybe a bit naive question, but more like a clarification. Um, so as far as I understood, two important aspects of uh, this model are that, as you said, the back reaction is such that you can still have some stochasticity in the classical system. And second, you say that the trade-off conditions are necessary to have um, um, a completely positive dynamics, right? That's right. Yeah, so and I was maybe just to clarify that that we're talking about here Markovian dynamics, so which I think would be the hallmark of a fundamental theory. So if it's an effective theory, it doesn't. You can imagine it's not Markovian, and then this trade-off doesn't need to apply. Um, and so this is really, uh, or at least is not so relevant. And so uh, th this condition is the 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 the, the, the big the, the big assumption is Markovianity, which I think any um, you know any fundamental theory has to have because you know, if there was a memory there which 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 remembered the past, then that doesn't sound like a fundamental theory to me. There's an environment, right? But uh, so I guess then we will have similar conditions also in the gravity case. Uh, and my question then would be, uh, how much that conditions are affected on how strong curvature is? Can you? I'm sorry, on how strong what, on, what is on how, on, how, on on which curvature scale you are? So because I would expect that if you are at very high curvature. Somehow, the, the the interaction between the two part, the two systems are strong enough that probably Markovianity does not apply. Or am I misunderstanding something? Uh, sorry, we're, we're, um, maybe you can repeat the question. So, uh, uh, first of all, do you have similar trade-off conditions also when you apply this uh, classical quantum dynamics to the gravitational case? Yes, indeed. Yes, and I think I understand your. So, so I think maybe what you're asking is about, you know, how do these 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 are coupling constants, and they presumably scale with the distance, right? So we, we, we you know, we have a path integral, and now we can ask, you know, uh, how these parameters scale with distance. Is that maybe what you're talking about? And so, what happens at the small scale? And yeah, but, but I was putting on the, in terms of curvature. I was just actually asking whether essentially. Uh, if you go to large curvature, whether the trade-off conditions are affected by by that? No, no. These are just these are trade-offs in the coupling constants. Okay, so so if if you start with some configuration that in which they are saturated, you expect that they are saturated all the way down to high curvature. That's right. Yeah, I mean the, the saturation is just we don't need it to be saturated. It just somehow we we need it in the path integral in order to prove complete positivity. Um, um, and also, it just it's just it's it's very cool this uh, condition because it gives us like purity of the quantum state, so it feels very attractive as a as a as a condition. But we don't need it. It's more that the it's more that the inequality has to be uh, uh, this inequality has to hold, and that has to hold at all scales. Otherwise, you have negative probabilities. Okay, I see. Thank you, uh, Carlo. Um, yeah, um, thanks, uh, Jonathan. First of all, uh, that was particularly clear. So I think I followed, uh, uh, I followed everything. I have to, I have to think about your, um, your experiment exactly, the logic, but I, I, um, I, uh, 
all the rest was clear. I, I have a question specifically, just whether you have thought about that, um, the application of this gravity, which is the one you uh, you want. When, when you go to gravity, you know, there are all these this typical gravitational complications. And the question has to do um, with, uh, uh, it probably has to do with what Eugenia was uh, was asking before. Question the following: Because um, because of the invariances, because of the essentially general coordinate invariance, um, once you 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 compute things, uh, it's 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 the distinction between what is gravity and what is matter. It's uh, uh, it's far from obvious, and uh, uh, in fact, the 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 most invariant degrees of freedom. What is what is different invariant? What is coordinate invariant? Is not GR alone, or or is just GR plus matter. So, um, in cosmology, typically, uh, it, it happens that the, the scalar perturbation you can, in, in some papers, you view as described as matter degrees of freedom or geometry. In some other papers, you describe you as a, as a geometry. And uh, uh, the answer who is right is uh, the question who is right is a meaningless question because the right. degrees of freedom are matter gravity degrees of freedom. So, mm -hmm. so yes. I wonder if you have. A, if you have a, uh, stumbled upon that if you have a way of thinking about that yeah so uh, maybe just to, to um, clarify the, the example so for example in inflation it's often what we often do is we take we set the metric in terms of the scalar field so we uh you know you can you can set your coordinates by uh yeah, exactly. by looking um, it's a coordinate and here, distinction more than a, than a, it's not a physical, it's a coordinate distinction with, with how to pull. Right, right. And here you can't do that. I mean, you, 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 you know, it, I mean, in the, you can do it in the path integral because, um, but, you know, in, 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 you know, there's a way of thinking about it where I would just say you cannot do that because you don't know what the value of that quantum, the, the field is. So you can't just set your coordinates in, in terms of that field. In the path integral, I suppose you could. Um, um, but I don't think that, so we, we have an example. Um, so, we, you know, I can give you a fully covariant theory, which is completely positive. Um, and, um, and so I don't think that there is a tension there in the end. Um, between so you, the two. you could write your two, your two extra terms, because one term is just a matter of gravity coupling, the, the, the two extra yeah. terms, diffusion and the, in a general covariant way. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so let me let me do a caveat. So in in this path integral paper with um, Zach Willer Davies, we write the path, the gravitational path integral, and it has a covariant form, um, but it has a um, a problem that you can't um, come up with a um, you can't come up with a positive. So the this one this co covariance matrix, this D two, it's actually a matrix. It's not just a number because you have different degrees of freedom, um, and so it's a covariance. Um, or like a kernel, and it has to be positive definite or positive semi-definite. Um, and um, you cannot construct one out of the metric alone, um, it turns out. Um, but it turns out, um, but I, I can construct some. So for example, if I do the trace of Einstein's equation, then that's um, positive semi-definite, and that's a, a fully um, covariant theory, um, and that's okay. And so for example, we have like a, a, Nord a theory of Nordstrom gravity, and a uh, theory which gives us the trace of Einstein's equation. If you want the full Einstein's equation, you can write down something which looks covariant, um, but it has some negative eigenvalues. Um, and it turns out that those negative eigenvalues um, are not so problematic because one multiplies the gauss bonnet term and one gets normalized away somehow. So things seem okay, but I think one needs, but we're still kind of in the process of checking these things out, I suppose. So I guess maybe a short answer to your question is, there are theories which exist, which are not quite Einstein gravity, like Nordstrom gravity, which is generally covariant um, and completely positive and looks okay. Um, and then for the full Einstein's equation, we have a candidate theory, um, and we're not 100% sure that it looks like Einstein gravity in the classical limit. And so that's this kind of, there is a bit of tension between um, this general covariance and the full Einstein's equation. Does that answer your question? Right. I mean, kind right. of. Yeah. I'll be following up. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Uh, Aniko? Uh, hi again. So, Jonathan, you said something about... So, you said what's um, uh, special about this theory is the stochasticity in the gravity 
uh, side. Mm -hmm. um, I have recently uh, encountered another theory which has this property. I don't know whether uh, they are related. Uh, I only know, so um, it's something about the uh, stochastic Ricci flow. Uh, uh -huh. yes. uh, uh, where they say that at equilibrium, uh, Einstein equations are satisfied, but out of equilibrium, there is on one side a like a stochastic process, and on the other side, there's the Ricci flow. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Antonino Marciano and Matteo Lulli work on it, but uh, do you think there is any uh, connection? Um, yeah, I, I didn't see it. So, 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 so someone has um, um, pointed this theory out to me um this result out to me i did um look at it and didn't see a relation but um i i mean i, I haven't looked at it closely i guess there's also for example there's bella who um and co-authors have uh, have a theory you know have a stochastic gravity which also has a stochasticity but kind of coming uh you know starting with the semi-classical einstein equation so that's kind of a, you know there are other theories which which have, maybe not fundamental or not but have like some stochasticity in it so uh you know, I think it's interesting to kind of understand the relationship between these different things. But um, at the moment, I don't see like a clear one, I suppose. Thanks. Okay, uh, I think we have one more hand up. Uh, uh, hi. I, hi, I have a question about how you, if, if I think your theory is right, okay. So under your framework, how can I, uh, uh, achieve a scattering process. A scattering process because you you see that you you theory have a classical geometry right and a quantum matter, and if I repeat the process we do in in the semi classical process, then we will have a radiation with the with the particle right. So if I take two subsystems over two particle. A and B, and those two uh, particle is entanglement. They have entanglement, and those two subsystems with with a parameter or uh, some degrees of freedom that is classical as as the geometry in your theory. Then I want to do a scattering process with with those mm -hmm. things, and when those two subsystems get too close, then they'll have a black hole and mm -hmm. the black hole will give you some radiation and they'll mm -hmm. have no entanglement. So uh, do you think that in your free work, is, is it possible to do a scattering, uh, the scattering process with that preserves those entanglement? Because and, and it seems like um, the entanglement will just disappear. Um, I'm not sure I completely understand the question in the sense that, um, you know, if I take an entangled system, um, and, you know, collapse things into a black hole, then I don't know what happens to the, I mean, in some sense, you know, I don't know what happens in any theory, uh, through that entanglement, whether it goes, you know, beyond the horizon and, uh, I'm not sure I would, would be able to say much about what happens in, in anything, um, but here, I guess I can interpret your question two ways. One is that there are these superpositions and, um, you know, I mean, I mean, somehow a superposition of different kinds of scattering processes. And the question is by monitoring the gravitate, maybe one version of your question is by monitoring the gravitational uh, waves, can I tell what happened in the scattering process? Is that a way of interpreting your question? Mm, I think so. So, like the, the gravitational field cannot carry away any entanglement, so that's for sure because it's classical. Um, it can carry information about what happened in the scattering process, or it can carry away information about whether these particles form black holes or not. And um, if, but, but because it's stochastic, um, um, then by reading out the gravitational radiation, I, I would not necessarily be able to determine exactly what happened with the scattering process. But if I carry, if I, if, if there's enough information in the gravitational waves, then eventually I do learn what happened in the scattering process. And, um, at that point, you, you know, you've essentially decohered your quantum systems. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah. 
or answers a slightly different question, which is adjacent to yours? All right, but uh, I think is that uh, basically we have two particle and they get uh, interchange with with each other and they get too closer. And so that uh, I want to know that the result of uh, the scattering process in your theory, uh, is it possible to get out with two particles that keep those entanglements? Yeah, so there, I mean, uh, um, yeah, so, so their interaction with the gravitational field, because the gravitational field is classical, that interaction could destroy the entanglement between them. Um, but it depends uh, how strongly their interaction is and what of what kind it is. So you could it just but that's the same with any environment. So if I I mean, it's it's even the same if the gravitational field is quantum in the sense that if the gravitational field, if they interact with the gravitational field, then that interaction acts like an environment. The gravitational field acts like an environment and can destroy entanglement between systems if I trace out that environment. Um, here, it can fundamentally destroy entanglement in the sense that even if I measure and even if I consider all the gravitational degrees of freedom, I still might not have any entanglement um, in my quantum system. So it can destroy entanglement, but it depends on the, on the kind and strength of the gravitational interaction. Does that answer the question? Yes, that, that's what I mean. Yeah, yes, okay. that's what I mean. That in your case, the, the gravitational and destroy some entanglement in quantum case, but uh, you you say if I get some random case that that some accelerated particle, then uh, w what is the environment well means? Because you you say mm -hmm. I can always create the the boundary. Uh, like less in the black hole case, right? It's just some boundary. If I get a particle that accelerates, then this accelerated particle will feel some different things with the with the quantum gravity things. Yes, but I guess if you know if if say some stuff goes behind a horizon. Then whether whether I treat the the degrees of freedom of the gravitational field as quantum or classical, if information goes past the horizon, then I've decohered my system, um, and it doesn't really matter if it's classical or quantum. Um, I, the only thing I can really say here, which I, is just that here you can have some additional you know fundamental loss of entanglement and coherence because the gravitational field is classical. Okay, that. That's the answer. I appreciate okay. your theory. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, great. Do we have any uh, any other questions? I could ask a very quick follow up question. What Jonathan was just saying. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> with respect to this idea that um, um, the stronger the gravitational interaction is uh, with the system, then uh, the more decoherence you're gonna get. Um, but is there something more to that than um, the mass being larger, or is are more complicated things possible? Uh, it has more to do with the density, actually. The um, could you, yeah, because you, you know the stress energy tensor acts locally on the gravitational field. The background is local, so um, yeah, it's yeah, a density sure. very high. Yeah. Are you just saying that the higher the mass density is, the faster the coherence rate induced by gravity, or is there something more to that? that it's way? more complicated than that, but I guess what I would say is that um, you have to look at it, uh, these figures of merit, which you, so we, in the, one of the things in the in the paper of the, on the trade-off and on the, the experiment is that we note that, um, you know, the decoherence rate is a little bit more complicated than, um, and so just merely, trying to run interference experiments between very heavy particles is, is it, you know, it tells you something, but actually you, gold atoms probably gives you a better uh, bound than say buckyballs or anything like that. So one has to look at the figures of merit. They're, they, they have to do, they're, they're not solely just mass or slowly mass density, but they, have a volume dependence as well. So. Might depend on the mass configuration in some way. As well, yeah. 
Yeah. Good. Thanks. I mean, I can, and I can also, you know, I guess there's some, you, you know, I think there's a very natural theory where you don't have much choice, where you just have a, the, this local uh, kernel, but you can also come up with other kernels, uh, and then the, the interaction, the, the figure of merit can be slightly different. So you need to be. Um, well, one needs to think about these experiments and it, and I think that there's, I think gold atoms might provide a, 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 a maybe worth reviving those sorts of experiments over just say buckyballs or heavier and heavier mass objects. I see, but this is not about the freedom of choosing the type of interaction, right? The theory is defined by these three constants. This is just... Uh... Uh, yeah, there, uh, um, so there, there could be a matrix, right, in the case where you have more degrees of freedom. So it's a positive semi-definite kernel. The matter side, but on the gravity side, um, the theory is fixed. Um, I would say that the natural theory is fixed. Um, so the natural theory is fixed, yes. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. Eric, can I ask for another clarification? Yeah, sure. I, I, yeah. So you were saying that uh, I, I didn't really get what you mean by uh, the interaction with the gravitational field can uh, can uh, destroy the entanglement because for the same reason uh, so since you think it cannot create entanglement for arguments of LOCC it should not be able to change the entanglement at all it, uh, if it's local in the sense of LOCC then it acts as local separate local unitaries and uh, best case classical communication so why would it destroy an entanglement or change the entanglement? Um, so I think there's two things. So I think you're so you're asking about these entanglement experiments, and indeed, as you say, in these entanglement generating experiments, the gravitational field is classical. So it uh, by LOCC you cannot create entanglement. Um, so I would agree with that. Um, you, I think, the context of can it destroy entanglement. Um, was in the maybe a slightly different context. Just if I have an interaction with a gravitational field, then you know it can cause decoherence and destroy entanglement. So that's a different kind of interaction. If, if it can destroy entanglement, it can definitely create entanglement. The only the only reason it cannot create entanglement is if it acts as two local unitaries. That's right. But it doesn't need to be a local unitary. So it doesn't need to be a unit. So um, imagine it's not a unitary, but measure. So you know, Alice and Bob. Or LOCC, they only talk on the telephone. They cannot create entanglement, but they can certainly destroy it by performing a measurement or by, you know, throwing one of their particles into a into an environment. Uh, uh. Uh, um, yeah, but so under unitaries, they can't destroy it, but under a CP map, they certainly can interaction with the environment. And because right. the theory is a stochastic theory, then they can do it. But why? Why are you assuming that interacting with the gravitational field is not unitary? Uh, and therefore can destroy entanglement. But in the context of a BMV experiment, it gets back unitary and then it cannot create entanglement. Like why it's unitary there and it's not unitary there? Well, the, 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 the assumption of the BMV is, you know, they show that you can, you can create, I don't, I don't think there's, a, it's a question of like, can you create entanglement? If you can create entanglement, then that's a quantum theory of gravity and then it's unitary. Okay. We're talking about uh, theories which don't create entanglement and can, in fact, destroy entanglement. So those are two separate classes of theories. One is deterministic and is quantum and does unitaries and can, can create entanglement. The other one is an LOCC, which can not create entanglement and can, in fact, destroy entanglement. Well, unitary and the LOCC are not uh, uh, exclusive. Uh, LOCC is local unitaries and classical communication, well, right? Or, well, local CP maps. All right, so local CP maps can, you say, destroy entanglement, but they cannot create any? That's right. Ah, OK, OK, thanks. Yeah. I, I understand. Decoherence is an example of a CP map that's local, a local decoherence. It can certainly destroy entanglement, but it can't create it. I, OK, now I understand. Yeah, thanks. OK, were there any more questions? Okay, I think, okay, looks like probably not. Well, uh, in that case, then I hope everyone
everyone can uh, thank me, uh, join me in thanking Jonathan for a really, yeah, really fantastic talk and also for uh, really generously spending your time answering all our questions. Uh, well, yeah, thanks everyone for the really great questions. It was a, yeah. enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks.